Um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time today. And so welcome, number one. You are here for the WaterWise presentation on Watersheds of Cochise County. It is the last of our um, presentations for this year in 2020. We do have a new lineup um, in progress for 2021. They will be brown bag seminars, just like this one. And uh, hopefully we'll get that out before the end of the year, if not the very first of the year, so that you can join us for those. Um, let's see, couple of introductions. So first and foremost is myself, uh, not foremost, but anyway, I'm Nicole Miller. I am the youth program coordinator and I help out with the community side of things. I um, do a lot of background, I'm doing technical today. And so if you have questions along the way, we can get to those. And then our uh, community program coordinator is Marianne Capehart. And I'll tell you a little bit more about her today because she is going to be our speaker in just a little bit. The housekeeping things I mentioned, um, please keep yourself muted until the end of the presentation. You'll then have the opportunity. I will open it up. If you have questions, you can unmute yourself to ask those questions. But if you have questions along the way, feel free to type those into the chat so that I will be monitoring those and then make sure that I can interject them at the appropriate time or we will get to them at the end of the presentation as well. This presentation is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, um, hopefully within a day. It takes a little time for it to convert and then I do a little editing myself to it. And then at the end of today's presentation, there will be a post event survey. I will put it into the chat, but you will also receive an email later this afternoon with that link into it. It's a very short uh, Google form. You just fill out a couple of things, just letting us know how we're doing and what we can do better. And I greatly appreciate if you took the time to do that sometime in the next couple of days once we finish this presentation today. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. I do have a, let's see, what is my, hmm, I'm not sure why my speaker mode. Anyway, so I want to talk a little bit about what watersheds are before Mary Ann jumps into her presentation today. So watersheds, I have a great little, I work with the youth, and so I am very hands-on, have this really cool um, demonstration. If uh, you have children at home, you're more than welcome to do this with them. It takes three sheets of paper, so just three standard sheets of paper, all right? Um, we're going to look at what a watershed looks like. So you're going to take your first uh, two sheets of paper, you're going to make a fist, and then you kind of crinkle your paper over the top. It's really, pardon the noise real quick. It's helpful if you have a second uh, set of hands, but I don't presently. My, my son is in school in the other room. So we make a little wad of paper and then you gently open up. And this is going to give you creases that once you kind of, and sometimes you have to play with it just a little bit. Again, pardon the noise. It's hard to hear that over me. I'm gonna stop talking for just a moment, open it up. And then you take this set of paper and you tape it down onto the single sheet of paper. All right, I'm sorry, it's kind of hard to see the white blanches out in the uh, light I've got here. So in the end, once you've got your paper taped down, you're going to go across the ridges of that paper. You can see, again, if I kind of turn it to the side, the crinkled paper, and I've gone where the really high points are, because where does water flow from? It flows from a high point to a low point. So I've marked all of my ridges along my high points with marker. All right, and this is going to show us where if there was going to be precipitation raining onto my mountain, where that water would flow to. So if water falls on this side of the mountain, where do you think it might be going? Is it going to go over the mountain and go down the other side? Most likely not. So then you need a water safe service. So I've got a sheet pan. I'm going to take said sheet pan and I'm going to spritz it with water a couple of times. And you're already seeing a cause when I lean this toward you, it's going to go towards you, but you're already seeing that the water is flowing down certain areas away from the ridges. All right, let's see if I can turn it so you can see it a little bit better. I may need a little more water. So we're going to spritz it a couple more times. Again, it's already starting. Again, it's hard to show you a three dimensional photo in a two dimensional world but you can see the water flowing down on that far side away from me. And this is what your watershed is. So any water that fell in this particular area, you can see is now pooling down here. It ran down the valleys and ended up pooling over here. We've got a little bit of the same thing on this side where the water has ran down the mountain. And if I spray it one more time, oh, we're getting lovely little rivers flowing down the sides of our mountains. So what you have is, 
Water falls on the top of the peaks and it moves downhill. It may start as a spring, it may start as precipitation, but it's going to flow from high to low and it will eventually end up into what I call the main stem or a river, all right? And those rivers eventually all, not all, most flow into the ocean. So a river will flow into another river, into another river that will eventually lead to the ocean. Some empty into large bodies of water within the continent, but um, typically they land in the ocean. All right, so that's my quick little youth demonstration on the watersheds. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of background on Marianne before she starts today. She is the coordinator of the WaterWise program here at the University of Arizona's Cooperative Extension in Cochise County. Um, she helps the community embrace water pract wise practices like conserving water indoors, collecting rainwater, using gray water, xeriscaping, and understanding the state of our watershed, which is what we're going to talk about today. She believes that most people want to keep their water supply plentiful, that's really important, and clean and enjoys encouraging and helping them to do just that. She is also an advocate for leaving uh, enough water in our waterways and our aquifers aquifers for the environment to flourish. It's not all about what we need, it's about what nature needs as well. Um, Marianne has a master's of environmental education from the University of Arizona in Tucson. She lives in Bisbee and she um, has recently uh, been working on some publications that hopefully she will have out here shortly. And let's see, is there anything else? I think, I don't think so. So thank you. I am going to let Marianne get started here. If she needs anything from me, she'll let me know. I am going to back away. I'm going to turn off my video and my sound. And again, if you need have questions, you can always uh, type those into the chat box. All right, Marianne, it's all yours. All righty. Thanks, Nicole. That was fun. Um, yeah, I love seeing that water flow down. And that's what we're talking about today is watersheds, in particular in Cochise County. So let me... Um, tell this to show the slide show, which I forget. Top right, present near your share button. Present, thank you, Nicole. All right. Okay, so today's topic, hi everybody, is um, watersheds in Cochise County. So um, the goals of this presentation is to people have a, a firm idea, firm, at least more firm, um, than previously about what a watershed is and to kind of look at the different ones in our county and some of the issues that are happening in them. So um, we're gonna talk about what is a watershed, the ba Wilcox Basin, San Pedro River. I'm gonna bring up groundwater a little bit. There is a very strong relationship. Um, talk a little bit about pumping and some other issues that are going on in the county. So watersheds. Um, surround creeks, rivers, lakes, bays, or oceans. And as Nicole said, most of the big ones run into the ocean. So we are part of the Colorado River watershed, um, which is a, I think it's five states uh, watershed um, that runs eventually into the ocean near Baja, um, Sea of Cortez. And within that is the Gila River watershed. So that's the sort of the one scale down. Um, watersheds fit into each other. So um, they have to do with high areas going to low areas as Nicole demonstrated. But within that is a larger high area going to a larger uh, low area. So they kind of fit into each other. And the tributaries, um, one river can be a tributary of a larger river and a tributary can also have, any river can also have smaller rivers, tributaries, excuse me, flowing into it. So the Gila River is part of the Colorado River watershed. Um, and here is just an analogy of watersheds being on different scales and kind of fitting into each other like Russian dolls. Um, and we'll get down to a, a, a small um, watershed, which is the Greenbush Draw near Bisbee. And that will go into San Pedro, which will go into the Gila, which will go into the Colorado River. So here's a picture of the San Pedro River watershed. And it starts in Mexico. And the, high, the um, 
in Sonora, the headwaters are there and it flows north. And there's several basins, there's four sub-basins. And this is a map of, of wells. So you can see there's quite a lot of them. And here is a smaller section of the river, the upper San Pedro River, upper being uh, to the south of the northern part of the river because it flows north. And here is the Sprinka, very important to us in the county and, and nationally um, because it is a protected area that um, contains a lot of beautiful um, habitat, riparian habitat for many, many species of birds flying over, um, living there and also many mammals and amphibians and reptiles. And here is a subwatershed that's part of the upper San, river, San Pedro River watershed. And um, all together, the Pen San Pedro drains about 5,000 miles of land. So that is, that is one of the things I wanna emphasize today is that there's a river, there's a body of water, but feeding that, influencing that is a much larger area of land around it obviously sloping towards that body of water um, or sloping towards a tributary of that body of water. So we need to think about what is that that's influencing um, the actual body of water that we are so eager to preserve so that we can maintain habitat for nature and to um, keep our own body waters healthy and thriving and um, productive for human and, and, and nature, both. And then we come down to this little area, 75 area, uh, square miles in area, which is a green birch draw. So you see, you can kind of get smaller and smaller. You can look in your backyard, find a tiny watershed that you might want to use to keep some water around when it rains, rather than having it run off into the street or somewhere and um, plant next to it. So that would be a little rain basin watershed. So um, again, the entire watershed has an impact on the body of water. So we have to look at that and see what we're doing to those, the upper areas of our watershed and see how well we're taking care of it and what impacts it might have on the body of water. Um, water moves very quickly um, and does not get absorbed by impervious surfaces. So you have, you know, the parking lots and roads and buildings that will change how nature intended for the water to be absorbed and eventually infiltrate into groundwater. So this is something we need to be very aware of. Um, it also increases the velocity and flow of water. You see a lot of cutting out on ranches around here, for instance where the water did not get absorbed by plant life, by grasses and so forth, and rushes down and then cuts out the sides of the, of the um, wash. And it gets really dangerous sometimes um, and reveals some pipes and things that people need to pump water. So that's an issue. Here's green brush draw and there's pumps. So this, this will be recorded if anybody wants to pour over these maps um, please feel free to find this PDF of this talk on the WaterWise website or the recording, which will end up there as well and also on YouTube. What is a watershed? Okay, I think we're getting close to understanding it. Um, definition is an area of land, all the land that drains um, precipitation into a body of water, a creek, river, lake, bay, or ocean. Um, and the boundary is the ridgeland, is so aptly demonstrated, of high land surrounding it like the edge of a bowl. And another term is drainage basin. So let's do a quiz real quick. Um, choose the best description for the watershed of a stream. I'll let you read this for a moment or two and pick your multiple choice. Is it the water of a stream? Is it the land, the wet area? If you're hiking along a trail, you know that you have reached the watershed of a different stream because... All right. 
The first one, the best description of a watershed is all the land that slopes towards the stream and drains rain and melting snow into the stream. Okay, so we're really talking about an area of land um, that sheds water. Um, you're hiking along a hilly trail, a trail in hilly countryside, you know if you reach the water set because you're standing on a high spot and the land starts to slope down again from one side or the other. All right, hope you did well. So um, we know that water is extremely um, important to us and nature and we use it in so, so many different ways. Um, washing, manufacturing, um, drinking, cleaning our, you know, our air, our um, everything, cars, our bodies. So um, it's becoming um, a commodity at this point. So what used to be the search for gold, furs, and land has now become the search for water. And recently, Bloomberg News announced that water futures are to be traded on Wall Street. And uh, I think it's 400 and something per acre feet was the trading amount when that uh, um, an announcement was made a couple of days ago. So we look at watersheds, I said water is so important, but we don't really base our lives around it in a sense, which we might have preferred to do is to think about what is feeding our water? Um, how do we take care of that area? What's the best way to, to manage it, to regulate it, to protect it? Um, so it's fun to do kind of a thought piece about um, what would have been if we thought more about rivers and waters. And um, actually John Wellesley Powell thought about this in the 19th century. He realized that water would limit um, the, the, the expansion in the West and that it would probably lead to conflicts between states, although we're doing pretty well in terms of conflicts um, with our Colorado River Pact. Um, but um, he just suggested boundaries be determined by watersheds, um, calling them the topo topographical basins that funnel water to a single exit point. So uh, we can look at some maps that people have done to look at maybe what would have been um, regions or a different way of designating states um, or provinces. So this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, about 10, um, based on the drainage basins, um, the watershed. So it's kind of fun to look at. And there's the Colorado River. And this one has a little bit more um, designating different parts of different rivers. Um, I think this is more like 18 of them. So uh, this way, the government in charge um, of this area would be very sensitive to the needs of the watershed, what the watershed was doing to flows to the river or, or a lake or stream um, and how to best manage it without having to negotiate with other jurisdictions. So it's a fun, fun thought piece. And here is one um, that was in the Washington Post that's even more uh, kind of expanding what we think of as states is to be more uh, watershed and river sensitive. So it's kind of fun to look at. Arizona looks very, quite different. It still has, the, I think the Colorado is still the Western uh, boundary, but it looks quite different on the East and so the North. And so that's a, that's a fun thought piece um, to think about if we put water front and center in terms of, of government really and, and management. Uh, I'm gonna talk about one of our um, basins in the um, Cochise County area of Arizona that is actually um, an interior draining basin. So a lot of basins go elsewhere through the river exiting down to eventually the ocean, if not, a, or a large body of water. This one is um, interiorly draining. And so it's pretty unique. Um, people know it for the sandhill cranes um, that, that come in, in large numbers. If you haven't been out there to see them, if you're in the area, please go. They're so interesting, especially the way they vocalize is amazing. Um, so there are issues here with the basin I'll get into, but you can see that 
there's um, different basins here outlined for the county. If that's something, if you're a map geek, geek like me, um, you will be interested in see what the different basins look like. So you see the Wilcox, you see the San Pedro, Upper San Pedro, you see the Douglas Basin, and then the San Bernardino Valley. Um, and here's one that has um, groundwater. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about groundwater um, basins, a little bit like watersheds, but they're under the ground and there are aquifers and they often um, kind of follow the watersheds above them, but not necessarily uh, all the time are they the same. So they're kind of roughly mirror the watershed. So this map has both. Um, so it's uh, kind of interesting to look at. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues in the groundwater in the Wilcox Basin. And this has to do with precipitation um, with water being um, recharged into the basin. And it also has to do with pumping that takes the water out of the, of the groundwater. So I just wanna, I, I'm, I'm kind of made it a little bit of my mission to talk about this right now, because I think it's, it's quite dire what's happening in that area. And um, I've been um, contacted by a lot of people who are quite concerned. So anyway, here's, here's a look at the well depth. So it looks around 300 for domestic wells, a bit, a bit more for irrigation, about the same for stock. And these are average um, well depths. And, but um, some of these are drying up um, as the water level, the water table levels go down. And it's actually been quite severe since pre-development areas, um, sorry, pre-development era levels, um, but it's, it's a lot of, of decline, a lot of uh, overdraft, you can call it. And so um, we want ideally to have how much goes in comes back out. So we don't take more out that gets pumped, gets, I'm sorry, recharged back in by um, precipitation, rain and snow. And that way it will maintain itself for future generations. So it's, it's sometimes called safe yield. What can you take out that won't threaten the future of the aquifer? So we're really taking out a lot more than is going in. Um, although this basin actually has a nice recharge um, potential. So this is creating um, some real concern with people who wells no longer function. They're not deep enough anymore. They may be able to deepen them, but they're worried that once they do, it might drop down again, um, or the well is underperforming. So they have to store a lot before they can use it because it's not um, performing at the uh, reasonable rate. So you can see that some of this has to do with these large agricultural ish, uh, entities coming in that are doing an amazing amount of farming and um, growing of grain and feed and so forth. Um, so there was a lot of coverage this in the, um, I'm sorry, NBC. There's been a lot of, of, of news coverage about it if you're interested. Um, here is a um, hydrograph at some point near one of these large concerns and you can see how long it's, how deep it's, um, the levels have gone. So they're below 300 um, feet from where, the, I'm sorry, around 200 feet from where they were in the um, 50s. And this goes up, it's projected. This is a model. No, I'm sorry, this is an actual monitoring. Um, we have um, government and agencies that monitor water, which I think is, is really important in this area because we don't have much regulation for groundwater extraction. You can pretty much drill a well, register that well, and then just take as many uh, gallons a year as you want. So it's good that someone's kind of looking at seeing in some of these monitoring wells, what is actually happening to the levels of the water underground. Uh, this is another issue that is affecting the Wilcox Basin, which is subsidence where the groundwater has been taken out to the extent where it no longer supports the soil above it. And then there's a collapse. Uh, which sometimes can fill with water, but if the water has some not so great things in the runoff, it can get to the aquifer, which is spreads that pollution out quite quickly. Anyway, as I said, there's a lot of um, news coverage about this. Um, 
people moving, um, you know, putting their life savings into a small ranch and or small acreage and then losing their well and being really stuck. Um, so my, one of my missions is to encourage people to do large scale rain harvesting. It's not a great year for that, but um, we do hope they'll be getting rains again next year. And then if you store a sufficient amount of rain that can be a substitute for drilling a well and having your water supplied by a well. So again, there's, there's no limit on how many wells can be drilled um, in the areas outside of our main urban areas, um, which are called active management areas. So that's one of the problems um, is that we're just, we're just pumping a lot. And there's many, many, many wells that are, the little ones are being uh, very affected by the big ones. It's like a, who has a longer straw? Your straw is short, the guy with the bigger straw uh, the person with the bigger straw will suck out that water and lower that level underground till your well might not work anymore. So this one um, has dropped over 60 feet. It's expensive to um, drill a well. It's, it can be around 30,000, 20 to 30,000 um, if you're drilling a well around 300 square feet. So it's, it's, it's a lot of money for, for a lot of people. Um, yeah, so kind of just look at this basin before we move on to the San Pedro, um, but you can see that we pump out this amount. Um, an acre feet is a football field full of water to one foot depth. So that's a lot of water um, that has left the storage of the basin. So that gives you some idea of how much water we're talking about. And this is a dairy that's um, been drilling a lot um, and a, has added a lot of, a lot of, of wells. So they need it to irrigate, to feed a, a, great, a great vast amount of, of dairy cows and calves. So you see that what they're doing, um, this is back in 2019 is, around half of the average that had been pumped between 1940 to 2015. So if they're not only the concern that's pumping a lot of water, you can see how we're really starting to pump a great deal of water and, and going very deep for it. Um, there was an hydrologist who spoke recently said that unlike a lot of basins, some of the deeper water is actually of good quality compared to some of the places around the state where the water at deep levels is, is, is briny. So uh, that makes it um, very attractive to put a large agricultural outfit here, um, drill a lot of wells and um, have good water. Um, there is, um, the Douglas Basin is actually protected as a um, district a non-irrigation expansion district, which kind of froze the irrigation in time to help preserve the ground, the aquifer, and to keep the businesses there um, thriving. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna switch over to the another basin, the San Pedro River Basin. Um, a lot, I think a lot of people are more familiar with that basin, um, but it's very, as I said, very important to habitat. And the last undammed and free flowing river in the desert Southwest, God bless its soul. Um, so it has a beautiful riparian area. Um, again, it's, it's extremely important for habitat and um, is, 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 is stressed. Um, it's stressed in different areas that used to be perennial and now are intermittent. And um, this year, you know, we have no monsoon. So it, it's, it's hard to to, to figure out what's the future of, of that river without with less precipitation due to higher temperatures. Um, so anyway, we are concerned. And uh, this is um, the parts of a riparian habitat. I won't get into too much detail about it, but you can see that the influence of the habitat extends quite a ways out from the river that also serves the needs of the wildlife out there in different ways. And so this is a diagram uh, made by Heather Swanson, a wildlife biologist, um, 
which if you're walking around the San Pedro River in the conservation area, the Sprinca, you, you can kind of take this with you and think about the different parts of that habitat. Um, the, a lot of the groundwater typically gets recharged at the mountain fronts at the base of the mountains. So that's, um, you can see kind of our classic watershed down there on the right with the mountains being the high point, the ridges, and going down into these low valleys, this basin filled valleys. So again, you know, we are depleting our groundwater faster than it could be replenished. And we have a lot of um, reasons why we don't want that to happen. Um, so it's, it's riparian, it's um, keeping the fort thriving as an um, entity that is um, encouraging the uh, preservation of our water sources and um, our, our, just our quality of life. All right, so um, again, the, similar to what's happening in the Wilcox Basin, but on a, on a, a smaller scale is, is this sort of um, over pumping. Um, so each year we have a deficit, deficit of what's being put back compared to what's being taken out. All right, um, San Pedro is um, protected in part by the Upper San Pedro Partnership. Uh, which is an awesome coalition, quite unique, I think, um, especially in its beginnings of how many organizations and different types of organizations were able to cooperate to help the preservation of this, of this river. So that's a, that's a really cool thing that's happening and it continues to happen. Um, again, this kind of uh, got stuck in here, but you can see um, where the river flows down to and where it connects with the aquifer. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, desert rivers are not just what comes across the land um, through precipitation or what comes from the, um, high, the headwaters. It's also how they connect to groundwater. You wouldn't see a river unless it was connected to groundwater um, because there's just not that much rain. So um, the groundwater at, as a level of groundwater intersects the base the called base flow of the river, you get a lot of the water in the river from that source. Um, so again, you know, we're taking water deeper and deeper, taking um, sort of fossil water at this point in some places with these deep wells. So that has taken a long time to um, accumulate down there. Um, but you can see, yeah, there's different layers and it connects to rivers. Here's a, a nice diagram from the uh, um, Upper San Pedro Partnership website. If you wanted to put that link up on the chat, um, Nicole, that would be great. So you can see how these two things are very connected. So if you're pumping groundwater, it will affect the river. Um, so you get a lot of the mountain recharge near the mountains. There's the mules, there's the wachucas, there's our watershed, and there's our groundwater connecting to it. So here's another kind of picture of that connection. And this is kind of how a river would normally um, pump. It's, it's not just where you're pump, how you're pumping, but where you're pumping, it's proximity to the river or the body of water. So it generally would flow down to the river with gravity, similar to how surface waters, rains and snows and so forth, flow down to a river, but this is underground. And yeah, you get these sort of cones of depression, which are a big part of pumping. And that can sometimes, if they get really big, uh, change the direction of where the water is flowing. And in some cases, where what would be flowing to the river, uh, as you see above, uh, once that pumping starts, starts flowing to the pump and even, even flow away from the river. So we have had some pretty severe warnings about um, what will happen to the base flow of the river over time from the, um, the USGS, the United States um, Geospatial Services. Oh my God, I, I can't remember what that acronym is at the moment, um, Geographical Services. So anyway, it's something, it's something we're concerned about. 
And here's a cone of depression in um, Sierra Vista, it's quite large. You can see the water level change in that area. Um, the red is greater than 20 feet. So um, something we're thinking about trying to deal with, keep it in mind um, when you um, want to think about maybe some legislation of how we need perhaps more regulation or something to think about in our rural areas to keep our aquifers functioning. All right, so you can see that some of this water, we're using more than it's going in again, taking out more than what's being replenished or recharged. All right, so that was one concern. I think, I think we have uh, covered those pretty well. There's also some water issues trying to adjudicate some of the water rights in the state. And so some of that water may need to go elsewhere, um, the water rights. So that's something that's ongoing and hopefully it'll be resolved, but it has been many, many, many years. Here's a picture of a fissure, kind of scary. Um, so there's also water quality issues. Um, I don't want to get too Debbie Downer here, so we won't get into that too much, but that's something also that if we care about water, if we're putting it front and center, because it really is um, kind of front and center in our lives. Uh, anyway, we, we, we don't want to have to think about it. We want to take it for granted. We want it to be there. It's so essential, so important, and it's so um, beautiful. Um, in its manifestations all over nature that we wanna just be able to take it for granted, but we really can't do that, especially in the arid Southwest. But there's also keeping things out of it, keeping the, wa the water quality good. Um, so some of that is septic tanks. I want to just briefly mention that it's really important. We do have a septic care workshop to keep your septic tanks pumped out on a timely basis so they don't overflow and go into our groundwater. So we have some issues around that um, in, several, in several areas of the county. And this is a little bit about the water rights. If you're interested, again, you can kind of pour over this um, PowerPoint or PDF of it um, if you wanna find out more about um, some of these water right issues, which will hopefully not affect um, us too much in the area once it's all adjudicated. So there's a lot of also amazing things that have been done um, in this area and we wanna keep doing them. Um, some of the landmark designations, the WaterWise program, um, as I said, the Upper San Pedro Partnership, a coalition of agencies and nonprofits and cities. And so um, it's been amazing. And then out of that came uh, the Cochise County Recharge Network. And so that is these, um, Recharge areas where you take a, a parcel of land, um, indent the land to the to create another basin in, in sense in a sense to get that water down to the aquifer in a place that will be beneficial to the river. And there's a lot of things that the city in Sierra Vista has done. People are actually very good homeowners about conserving here. We could probably be better, but we are we're quite effective, the population has grown and the water use just has not. So that's another great thing in the environmental operations park. Also a tour that we often give um, has a, a large recharge area, which is also a nature, good place for nature. Um, so that is a, a great thing to do. And there's a picture of one of the recharge basins. Um, you can see how many acres it is. Um, and here's the whole network of various recharge basins and it's continuing. So it also helps control flood. As I mentioned, you get these fast flows. So that's another good reason to have um, basins to recharge um, stormwater. When stormwater is rain once it's hit the ground. Um, so, there's natural resource conservation districts also do a lot of great work installing anti-erosion structures, um, smaller structures that um, slow down the water, help it sink or spread the water 
and have it sink on a wider area are, are extremely effective. They're very labor intensive, but they're not very expensive. So those are great things to consider on ranch lands and so forth, and even in a smaller scale on your own land is to keep the water on your property. Keep it there, help it infiltrate into the soil, add soil moisture, um, keep it from running away and getting polluted. And you know these these areas. It depends on the um, how well a certain part of the land infiltrates water. Um, how far it is from the groundwater and the distance from riparian areas are three of the considerations for these retention basins. Um, drought is a is an issue. Um, we we've, we've really been hit with it this year. I'm so hoping predictions based on La Nina rain pattern, uh, weather patterns over the Pacific are not going to prove true. They are statistical um, and we'll get some winter rain to help offset our, our non-soon or uh, also called failed, failed monsoon. And then we have the Central Landscape Partnership also a very um, proactive positive thing that we're doing to protect our watersheds and our groundwater. Um, so they do a lot of interesting and different things in that um, sort of a glove shape area around the fort, something to look into. And that's pretty much it for our watersheds uh, presentation today. So if you have any questions, as Nicole said, you can put them in the chat. Thank you, enjoy your lunch and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Have a great day, ladies and gentlemen. Bye.